Hi, my name is David Jung, and I am one of the co-chief executives here at Beyond Our Borders. Today, we're here with Mr. Gary Braschini, who has a PhD in anthropology with specialties in archaeology and cultural resource management. Mr. Braschini has written multiple books on Central Californian history, and he is currently the president of the Monterey County Historical Society. Mr. Braschini, thank you for having us here. So just to start things off, would you mind telling our viewers a little bit about yourself and what you do, what you do here at the Monterey County Historical Society? Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm currently president. That means I oversee the board of directors. Uh, we try to collect and preserve the history of this area. Uh, we do less of interpretation of that history, but collecting and preserving it is our main goal. We have uh, an 1897 schoolhouse. We have an 1898 Victorian residence. Here behind me is an 1846 adobe, all preserved, mm -hmm. all restored. We have a 1930s Filipino farm labor bunkhouse, possibly the only one still in existence. Uh, across the way we have a monument, a memorial to the Bataan Death March of which many residents of this area took part. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a perfectly restored half-track as part of that, as well as plaques giving all the names. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to present our history, not so much interpret it, uh, but just save it and present it to people who are interested. Yeah, thank as you. Yeah. Part of that, we've done quite a few books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so jumping right into it, uh, going into Spanish and Mexican history, as a president of the Monterey County Historical Society, you're quite well versed in the Spanish influence of the area. Now, records show that the first hint of Spanish traces in this area date back to around the 1780s, far before the Dominion of the United States ever headed this far west. What aspects of the initial Spanish influence are still apparent, and how did the Spaniards cultivate a lasting cultural impact? Well, in this area, the Spanish uh really didn't do much. They settled in Monterey in 1770, established the mission at Carmel, and the Presidio, the fort, was the capital of California for many years, but there was no town of Monterey until close to 1820. So the influence was largely as a government center. The population of the area for the, the Spanish was very low. There were no land grants yet. That was all to come later during the Mexican era. So the Spanish influence was quite minimal oh, in this area. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so as you mentioned, you mentioned the missions in the area, uh, such as San Juan Batista and even the mission down in Carmel, which were or originally created by the Spanish and have served as centers of the community. How have these Catholic influences clashed with existing Native American animist traditions and shaped the Salinas Valley? Well, the two earliest missions in this area were Carmel, 1770, actually started in Monterey and moved the following year to Carmel, and San Antonio, 1771. And the goal was to bring the Native American groups into the mission and essentially make them uh, Spanish citizens. And that's what they tried to do. Uh, the unfortunate aspect of that was disease. Mm -hmm. They had uh, at the missions overworked, bad food, poor living conditions, and the total demoralization of these peoples. And given all of that, the imported diseases were devastating. Mm -hmm. And so during the mission era, 1770 to 1834, the population in this area dropped upwards of 90%. Mm -hmm. The death rate was huge. Mm -hmm. And so you ask the influence on the missions of the missions on the people. Uh, by the time the mission era ended, there were very few Native Americans left here. You had intact cultures far to the north and to the interior, but this area the cultures were unfortunately very badly disrupted. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned many of the consequences of Spanish influence. 
but in what ways did Spanish immigrant culture and American Indian culture blend together to create a distinct Californian culture in the 1800s? Uh, largely they did not. Mm -hmm. uh, the, during the Spanish and Mexican eras in this area, the Indians uh, remained apart. They never, in most cases, were fully accepted into the culture. Now the Spanish goal was to preserve land for the Indians. And when the Mexican Revolution occurred and Mexico took over this area in the 1820s, that land was given away over the next decades as land grants. And it was not given to the Indians. And so by the 1830s and into the 1840s, uh, the Indians were still very much second-class citizens. They were farm laborers. Uh, they were laborers in the kitchens, vaqueros, mm -hmm. but they were... Uh, in many cases by then they were mixed with Mexicans and that was the way to a higher status is to be Mexican rather than Indian. Mm -hmm. So the question asked how they merged, uh, unfortunately in many ways they did not merge. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, one hot topic that is currently being debated is that of undocumented immigration. In 1848, the U.S. signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, giving us the border with Mexico that we know of today. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, were there many restrictions when it came to immigrant uh, documentation? Uh, yeah, we had in the 1880s the Chinese Immigration Act, uh, restricting Chinese. Uh, 20, 30 years later, the same for the Japanese. So there were attempts to limit immigration. Mm -hmm. But the southern border was not really a, a spot for much immigration. Mm -hmm. It was primarily uh, farm labor coming in from China and Japan. Mm -hmm. And when those two were restricted by law, then the Philippines. And they could not restrict Philippine immigration because after the War of 1898, the Philippines were a U.S. possession. Mm -hmm. They were essentially U.S. citizens. So the immigration of uh, into California, 30,000 Filipino workers uh, went ahead. There was no way to prevent that. Uh -huh. So bouncing off that question, what was the perception that U.S. citizens had of undocumented immigrants coming in from Asia? Um, it varied, depending on where you were. Uh, Salinas had a large Chinatown. The communities were quite well accepted in most cases. Uh, the same when the Japanese uh, were the dominant labor. And as the Japanese and the Chinese before them were restricted, uh, they largely moved up. And they moved into uh, owning shops. The Japanese were some of the earliest innovations in uh, agriculture. The first uh, lettuce crops were done by Japanese. And in fact, in uh, 1942, when President Roosevelt uh, interned the Japanese, the strawberry industry was virtually wiped out because mm -hmm. the strawberry industry was the Japanese at that time. And so the effects in this area were probably different from other areas that uh, these groups had integrated into the culture. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, mm -hmm. more so than probably some other areas. Yeah, uh, thank you. So the gold rush of the 1850s caused a significant outflux of able-bodied men in the pursuit of quick acquisition of wealth in gold. How did this population decrease affect the immigrant workers in the area? Largely it did not because uh, in 1849, 1850, when the gold rush occurred, the uh, Chinese were not yet a major part of the labor force. Mm -hmm. They came in in many ways during the gold rush to work the mines and the, uh, the, the diggings. Then uh, many moved on to the railroad and it was only when the railroad was completed I think in 1869 that so many then moved back into the towns. Mm -hmm. So uh, the gold rush itself did not affect the immigration in this area because while the people like Monterey dropped from 3,000 to 1,000 in population during the gold rush, uh, 
the labor force had not yet been established from immigrants. Mm -hmm. The labor force, such as it was, was uh, the people themselves and, to a lesser degree, Native Americans. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, when it comes to Central California and Southern California, what effect did the existing fairly dominant Mexican culture have on American immigrants moving, uh, or em American migrants moving into the East? It had very little effect because even though the Mexican culture was dominant, it was very small. Mm -hmm. The Mexican population of California in, say, the late 1840s to early 1850s was only a few, maybe 10,000. So it was a very small culture. It uh, was dominant in that it was the dominant culture, obviously, but uh, when you had 100,000 people coming in from the gold rush and with the completion of the railroad, many more, the wagon trains and all the rest, uh, it was very quickly absorbed. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this area, we have the California Rodeo. Everywhere else in the country you have rodeos. But we have a rodeo because it comes from the Spanish-Mexican, primarily Mexican tradition. Mm -hmm from a Spanish word and so in this area the rodeo the roundup of the cattle in the, uh, the fall or whenever it was was part of the tradition and that has persisted all the way down to the present and that we're the only rodeo in this area everything else is a rodeo so some aspects of that tradition have continued uh, Monterey for example is considered to be uh, an adobe town, mm -hmm. and that's all from the Mexican era. Mm -hmm. The Spanish era had virtually no buildings that survived, except for perhaps the uh, Presidio Chapel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So moving on to the uh, issue of Asian immigration, the usage of Chinese labor was largely prevalent in the drainage of the Salinas swamplands to facilitate dry farming of wheat and barley, creating the second largest Chinatown in the state behind San Francisco's. How did a strong Chinese immigrant background affect Salinas' immigrant and agricultural uh, success? Well, the farming in those days, as you mentioned, was dry farming, no irrigation yet. Mm -hmm. And irrigation was another 30 years later. So it was all dry farming, and the Chinese were the primary labor for draining the swampy area. Salinas comes from the term salt marsh. Mm -hmm. And the lower Salinas Valley out in this direction was uh, sloughs and hummocks and that all had to be drained and leveled. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese labor was dominant in that. But in following up after the 1870s when that had been accomplished, uh, Chinese were part of the labor force, but by then they were moving into uh, shopkeepers, uh, running their own businesses, uh, laundries. That's one uh, stereotypical example, but if you look at some of the early maps that uh, depict what businesses are in town, mm -hmm. the Chinese were starting businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it was not long before they moved out of the farm labor, mm -hmm. and that's why the Japanese were brought in to replace them, just mm -hmm. because so many of them had uh, moved on. Mm -hmm. And the Chinatown was the center of that, but uh, by no means the only part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going into the Japanese, during World War II, the Salinas Rodeo Ground served as a temporary detention center of Japanese Americans at the time. How did this affect Salinas' perceptions of outsiders and Im immigrants, and how did it affect its overall culture? Well, the Japanese who were interned were not looked at so much as outsiders. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents knew a, a lot of those folks, and they were looked at as Selena's residents. And so when they were interned, as I mentioned before, it devastated the uh, strawberry industry. Uh, a lot of the Japanese by then were shopkeepers or had other occupations other than agriculture. And that was all lost. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were their own, had their own land and were farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the books I helped write, 10,000 Years on the Salinas Plain, we have a story by one of the Japanese ladies whose parents were interned. She was a senior in high school. And 
she describes the, the process. And it's a very touching story. Mm -hmm. And they let a, the, the next door farmer have their land while they were gone. And he farmed the land and made the payments on it. When they returned, he gave them their land back. Mm -hmm. And she concludes, there's no place like the Salinas Valley. Mm -hmm. yeah. A very touching story. So I wouldn't consider the uh, Japanese at that point as outsiders. They were an integral part of the valley and the ag agricultural industry. They had uh, moved very quickly in the 1920s into the irrigation uh, cropping. Uh, some of the earliest lettuce was done on private plots behind their houses in the early 18 or 1920s. Uh, they were an integral part of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That was a very touching story. Um, and due to its lucrative agriculture industry, Salinas was the highest ranked city in the country for per capita wealth in 1924. How has Salinas managed to maintain its significance in the agriculture industry while adapting to the changing times? Well, the thing that made Salinas so wealthy at that time was a century lettuce. And other row crops have grown in prominence since then. Uh, still, after we're just close to 100 years, uh, Salinas Valley grows somewhere around 30, 33 percent of the world's lettuce. Mm -hmm. And so that has been the, the way to keep this area prosperous. Mm -hmm. And in addition to lettuce, uh, all of the other crops are being grown. Mm -hmm. uh, artichokes. That was pioneered to the north of here, Castorville and Half Moon Bay. Uh, some of the lands that were lettuce are now artichoke. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, wine now. We're, this is one of the, the preeminent grape areas in the country now. Mm -hmm. So uh, agriculture has dominated the the landscape literally since the 1870s, mm -hmm. although the type of agriculture changes. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, uh, the land grants, the ranchos, that was all cattle raising. Mm -hmm. There was very, very little uh, large-scale agriculture yeah. in those early days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we've spoken a lot about agriculture as a whole. But let's go a little bit more into Canary Row. Canary Row is a hub of immigrant activity. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about what ethnicities were represented in the sardine factories? Uh, quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know all of them, of course, but uh, we had one Native American friend who unfortunately died a few years back. She worked there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all of the groups. This is touched on pretty well in uh, Steinbeck's Cannery Row, yeah. how many different groups were in there. but. Uh, yeah, you're right, it was a hub, and there were a lot of different groups working there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did World War I boost the sardine industry in Monterey, and in what ways did local immigrants benefit? Well, local immigrants uh, benefited by the jobs, of course. Uh, but it wasn't just the Cannery Row. Uh, some of the other occupations that are little known uh, some of the Japanese were preeminent abalone divers. The Kadani family, for example, uh, they came over and set up abalone operations. And they shipped the abalone then back to Japan. Uh, so there was a lot of other things. Uh, the Chinese had fishing villages all around the peninsula. Uh, so it wasn't just uh, Cannery Row. Cannery Row was a large fluorescence that came later, mm -hmm. working on the, the things that had been developed earlier. Mm -hmm. And it lasted only while the sardines were so prominent. Yeah. But as Steinbeck wrote in uh, Sweet Thursday, uh, eventually they caught and cooked and canned them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've mentioned a lot about small influences. But some of the larger influences were Hoft and Canneries and Del Mar and the Del Mar Canning Company, and they were prominent industrial forces in the early 20th century. What incentivized executives of these country, uh, companies to hire foreign workers when nationalism may have been running high? 
Well, they needed workers, mm -hmm. and they hired everybody who would work. Mm -hmm. uh, Steinbeck's books uh, portray a lot of this, mm -hmm. and his uh, letters as well. Uh, some of the, uh, as he termed them, paisanos, in Sweet Thursday, uh, Tortilla Flat, mm -hmm. when they needed work, they went down to the canneries, and they worked until they got what they needed. And so it was uh, a source of jobs for the whole community. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they brought in that many people from the outside. Now, Spreckles brought in uh, Mexican laborers for the first time during World War II. Because prior to uh, World War II, the labor force had always been Native Americans followed by Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos. World War II, uh, 1842, or 1942 to 44, roughly, uh, that's when the first Mexican immigrants were brought in uh, as laborers. The Bracero program developed from that. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the labor had been brought in that worked in the canneries prior to uh, World War One and even World War Two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And how have these immigrant communities developed and prospered in the current day? Well, we have quite a few uh, local historical groups or cultural groups. Uh, we work very closely with most of them. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our annual barbecue coming up on Sunday. We invite all of the local historic groups to come and set up a table and pass out membership forms and brochures. Uh, we have the Filipino American Historical Society local chapter. We have uh, Chinese, Japanese, other groups, uh, the NAACP. Uh, so we have a lot of groups in this area, and many of them are represented on our board of directors as, as well. Mm -hmm. But our barbecue, we try to bring all the historical and cultural groups together, and uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much for having You're us. You're most here. welcome. Thank you very much.